So Joe Biden basically staved off the worst case scenario for himself while also handing Donald Trump the best case scenario for this 2024 presidential election. He survived his big boy press conference by any means with the standard being as low as the innermost circle of hell. You basically have a situation where you see a current president who is by all means completely senile, at least alive enough to stay the nominee. And we're going to look into a good article by Scott Greer as to why Joe Biden will stay in the race. And we're going to prove it with facts and logic. So let's get into it. Mind you, this was written right before the press conference. This was in light about two weeks after the horrible debate performance by President Biden. And we're going to read it from the top. It's been two weeks since that disastrous debate performance. And the number of Democrats wanting a new nominee continues to grow. Right now, we have about 17, by the way, official Democratic politicians, congressmen, uh, senators that are saying that, you know what, Joe, you need to step out. And then everybody else is either, uh, you know, being kind of mum about it, waiting to see where the wind's blowing, or at least kind of advocating for Joe. People like Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Akeem Jeffries, who's the current speaker, I believe. And then Obama's also uh, tacitly kind of knew of a silo attack, basically from uh, George Clooney and that sort of people. And he let it happen. And so it seems like Obama's also not pleased with what's going on with the party. Uh, so these people probably want Kamala. Now, obviously, we're going to see why in this article that's not going to really happen. What people fail to realize is that the Bidens and his family are a-holes. This was a well-known fact when Joe was a senator. When he was vice president, the media transformed him into a lovable uncle who spoke his mind and delivered hilarious sound bites. Now, let me add on to this, guys. Again, this is pure nerd trenches. This is not your typical presidential election prediction. This is for the true political autists like me. So if you guys remember, and honestly, I might have been one of five people that have ever seen this, but if you look into, I think it was a PBS interview with Joe Biden in 2007, he was doing rallies in uh, Iowa because he was running for president. He got eviscerated, obviously, by Obama and Clinton in 2008. But the point being is that at the time he was questioned, hey, what do you think of the McCain and uh, by, uh, sorry, and Bush promoted surge in Iraq and Afghanistan, how would you deal with it as president? And then Joe Biden literally said that he would divide the country of Iraq into three separate countries and that that would somehow fix it. So clearly the guy's an idiot. And so that kind of just adds on to it. But anyhow, the Biden's egg hole tendencies are best exemplified and how they handled their dogs constantly attacking staffers. They did not give a scintilla of a crap that their dogs bit Secret Service agents and terrified White House employees. That was a problem for others, but not for Joe and Jill. The president watched as his dog attacked multiple subordinates without any concern. The Bidens flipped out only when people expressed worries about the dogs, and the well-being of others didn't even matter to them. They only relented and got rid of the dogs after the press had shamed them about it. So a little token and a little crumb of as to what happened there. Some say this proves that the Bidens will drop out. Well, they'll claim that, you know, if they came from a certain backlash like the dog incident from a, a couple of years ago, that they would do the same thing with the campaign at the national level. This is obviously the wrong view. These dogs are nowhere near as important to them as the presidency is. Jill knew keeping the dogs made them look like a, hor a horrible first lady. This sullied her White House image, which is the most important thing to her. Getting rid of the dogs upheld the Biden's identity as the president and the first lady. This is their everything. They will sacrifice their own dogs for it, and they're not going to abandon it to satisfy their critics. Okay, the Bidens are white trash with elite pretensions. Now, key, key term that, highlight that. If you were in a study group, this is exactly where you'd highlight because this is super important here. White trash with elite pretensions. Why is that important? It'd be one thing when you're the Bush family where you're your own dynasty. You're white trash. Not at all. You are coming from Yale. You're coming from the Andover private school. Uh, you have no pretensions. You know you're rich. You know you have a lineage of you know the, the wasp elite. Uh, the Bidens don't have this. They're middle class at best. Um, not dissimilar from the Clinton family. Only that the Clintons didn't have these like elite pretensions. They were just power hungry. And that's a separate issue. Anyway, Hunter's life story testifies to that, but he's not alone. The 43-year-old Ashley Biden danced inappropriately for the whole world to see at the White House, July 4th. And that's not even classy. Joel Biden's existence on being called Dr. Biden actually perfectly illustrates the elite insecurity. Now think about that. So Ashley Biden is a known drug abuser, has gone to rehab several times. Amy Winehouse would have had a great time with her. But basically, I've read her diary on two separate occasions. It tells you exactly that. There's the whole shower controversy with Joe, too, when she was uh, too old for it to be appropriate to shower with her father. God knows how old that is. Is that five years old, eight years old, 10 years old? We don't know. 
Uh, but that's definitely a red flag that she even was writing that down. You know, if she wrote that down in her diary, knowing there's an off chance that it could leak, then think about what it's in her mind that she hasn't let out yet onto paper. And so that's a very scary thing to think about for a lot of Americans. But moving on, uh, you know, this whole story about her dancing, I never saw. But I also didn't know that Frank Biden, who is the uh, is Joe Biden's 11 years younger, younger brother, his baby brother, Frank, was on a gay dating website and he took a nude selfie like at the age of 70 and it leaked and he confirmed it was his. I only learned about this yesterday, which is to say like, what the, like what else is there? Like, you know, talk about white trash. That's crazy. Um, But anyhow, while Biden brags about his working class background in campaign speeches, he wishes he came from a wealthier stock. As you can learn from Richard Ben Kramer's famous account of the 1988 presidential campaign, what it takes. Biden's dad desperately wanted to become rich and he failed at it. And that shaped his son's life. The modest circumstances humiliated Biden because he wanted to be elite and he succeeded through the dumb luck of winning a Senate seat in 1972 and made his wealth and stature entirely through politics. Keep in mind why this is important. This might seem like a Freudian overture uh, towards psychologizing and rationalizing why Biden will stay in the race, but it actually perfectly dictates why it would be. First of all, Joe Biden running in 1988 and then him running again 32 32 years later kind of shows that obviously uh, he wanted to be president at a young age, young as in maybe back then he was in his 40s. But what I mean is is that he was uh, steadfast in becoming president. And that is to say that he has an ambition in his mind and that he won't be fully satisfied until he gets a full two terms like Obama did and all that. And think about the emasculation of, of Joe Biden being in the Senate for decades at this point. Let's say in 2008, this upstart black guy who is 20 years younger than you uh, just completely destroys you. And in fact, your peer, Hillary Clinton, she gets destroyed by Obama in the primary, despite being outfunded and outgunned because Obama was more talented than not only Joe Biden, but also Hillary. So imagine you're the old white dude and this guy just takes your spot, presumably. And mind you, in 2008, Biden had already ran for president 20 years prior. So he had all this time to prepare and then he still got destroyed. Also, keep in mind, in 1988, there was a scandal that he plagiarized a labor politician's uh, British uh, speech. Uh, The guy's name was Neil Kinnock. And so it shows a lack of work ethic if he's plagiarizing. And also, obviously, there's a deception when you plagiarize, which a lot of college people do. So I don't even care. But the point is, is that at that instance, he was, I think, 45 years old when he did that mistake. And so it's kind of like showing that, okay, fully grown man still doing this sort of stuff. And even beyond this. Uh, he also got caught in lies when he said, oh, I graduated top of my law school class. And it's like, dude, you don't have to lie about that. He's just trying to add credentials where he doesn't have them. It's preposterous. It's preposterous. And then again, to win the Senate in 1972 at the age of 29, this is a little crazy. Now, granted, it was Delaware. Um, and so it, it, it kind of makes sense why that happened. Delaware, obviously not a, a lot of people are looking into it. So for a 30-year-old uh government lawyer or whatever to win a Senate seat is not crazy. And so we got lucky. And the thing is is that it'd be one thing if you won a House seat on a fluke where people weren't looking, but he became a senator and that carries enough weight to where he could have literally just sat in Delaware for 50 years in the Senate and nobody would have batted an eye. So that's a notable thing for sure. Because think about it. Now, this sort of deep thinking actually is appropriate to look into. And so I don't feel bad in to kind of like nitpicking Joe Biden's life because he is the president. Look at this. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, he got his Juris Doctorate, so his law school degree, from Syracuse University College of Law, which is not a notable law school. I didn't even know that existed until just now, and I'm trying to get into law school. So it's like, come on. Uh, so that so he graduated law school in 1968. That would have made him 26 or 25 years old. The issue with this, obviously, is that he probably graduated a year late. So just by that logic, it's not perfect because... Uh, What that usually means is that you're doing it slow. You took a gap year, not the cutting edge of a law school, in my opinion. Now, I'm nitpicking it because he claimed that he was the top of the class, but oftentimes you'd be at a quicker position if you were to graduate from law school at the top of the class. But anyhow, in his first year of law school, he failed a course because he had plagiarized a law review article for a paper he wrote, but the failing grade was later, later stricken. His grades were also relatively poor. He graduated 76th in the class of 85 students, and he was admitted to the Delaware Bar in 1969. So think about that. He got admitted to the bar at 27, presumably, when you're supposed to be admitted, usually if you're just going off of your undergraduate to law school at like 25, 26. So you see how there's a little bit of a discrepancy. Again, this was like 60 years ago, and so people don't really pay attention. But me, who is kind of familiar with the process more than the layperson, actually can notice what's going on there. 
here's another aspect I wanted to cover too. Uh, so again, 76 out of 85 is abysmal. Think about that. So he graduated in the bottom like 15% of his class. And again, he had a feeling great due to plagiarism, but the, the grade got stricken. So he just got lucky that I guess his, uh, his whoever was grading him just gave him a get out of jail free card. Kind of like with the Robert Hur investigation, by the way, with the classified documents where they said, ah, we're going to let it slip. Now, here's another interesting part. He started out as a public defender, which is pretty common. Obviously, if you're starting out as a lawyer, once you get admitted to the bar, you do the grunt work like public defending. And the issue obviously comes with the fact that he became a Democrat around this time. This is interesting for a couple of different reasons, but to move on, he um, also had another attorney and formed a law firm. But the law firm didn't go anywhere, obviously. And corporate law did not appeal to him. And criminal law did not pay well, which is interesting because, again, criminal law is clearly lucrative if you're good at it. Duh. Uh, but, of course, he did not do well at it. Therefore, he had to supplement his income by managing properties, which is to say, how the hell did he get money to start managing properties when he was a broke college student with a middle class background? It doesn't really make sense to me. Anyway, at the age of 28, so as soon as he becomes a lawyer, within a year, he runs for the fourth district seat in the Newcastle City Council or County Council in 1970 on a liberal platform. Okay, so keep in mind this. So he wins this election. Again, the city council isn't really something that, you know, oftentimes if you really half ass it in a place like Delaware, there's a good chance you do win. Uh, because obviously people don't really invest money into that sort of like politi political positioning. So that kind of explains it. And then he won the Senate uh, through campaigning pretty hardcore. Uh, so we can give him credit for that. But I guess that was pretty lucky. Also, notice there's no writing, at least on Wikipedia, between him becoming a public defender and kind of quitting law to becoming a senator. Like he did nothing with his legal uh, law degree. So he probably just used it as a... Uh, just as a paperweight to say like, oh, well, look, I'm qualified. I'm a lawyer. And it's like, dude, you did nothing with your degree, which is even worse than Obama. Obama was a lawyer, but he used it more than Biden did, actually. OK, anyway, back to the article. His wife and kids, grandkids, owe everything to the Biden political stature. If he steps away from the White House, all of it is threatened. The Bidens make money from the patriarch being important. Once he leaves the White House, all that political power will be gone and he will be a frail, senile man that no one wants to hear from. Isn't that important? Okay, think about it. What has anybody in the Biden family achieved outside of Joe being the politician in the family? Absolutely nothing. Hunter Biden, a loser. Um, Ashley Biden, also a loser. And I'm saying that because they're drug addicts and one's a felon. The other one is lucky because she's probably a woman that they probably don't prosecute her. And they feel bad for Ashley, but whatever. We'll disregard it. And uh, Jill Biden, it was said before she has a doctorate degree in teaching and then insists on being called Dr. Biden, which is insane. I know people with doctorates in astrophysics and all those sort of things. They get called professor because they're not pretentious D-bags. But the insecurities of somebody like uh, like uh, Jill Biden kind of is very exemplified by her even demanding people in the first place to call her doctor. It's pathetic. You know, what sort of doctor ever says, please call me doctor? It's like, dude, if you're in the doctor's office, I'll call you doctor. But, oh, well, I have a, a degree in poli sci. Okay, who cares, man? So anyhow, so he's going to be a senile man that no one wants to hear from. This is actually true. Nobody, do you really think, let's say Biden were to retire after this election. Do you think in 2026, anybody's going to be like, oh, where's Joe at? They don't give a shit about him. Jimmy Carter is about as relevant as uh, Biden would be, even though one's been out of office for over 40 years and one would have been out of office for a weekend. Think about it. Uh, so anyway, the Bidens will not be able to follow in the steps of the Obamas or the Clintons. Joe can't give speeches anymore, which is true. You know, people pay for Bill Clinton to show up places and do something like a speech or something. And they'll say, oh, he's still charming, whatever. Or even Hillary, as gross as she is to me and most Americans, some people like her for some reason. Uh, and obviously with the Obamas, they have that charisma in spades when it comes to appealing to people even out of office. But nobody could ever go for a Joe speech. In fact, as president. He brags about getting a few hundred people at his rally. So God forbid he actually isn't in power. He'd probably not even get half of his grandchildren at his next rally if he were to be out of office. Nobody admires Dr. Jill in a way that they fond over Hillary and Michelle, which is true. Dr. Jill is super off-putting. Her stock is going down and down given that she's becoming more prominent in the media. She puts herself on like Time Magazine and whatever have you. And it's just like very disconcerting. You know, think of Melania who did not put herself in the spotlight at all. And people tend to like that because not only are you like an attractive woman in that case, but you're, but you're quiet. 
because you're not a politically elected person. You're not supposed to have a say. The last person that was trying to do something as first lady was probably uh, Hillary Clinton when she was uh, rushing a health care solution in 1994, which was really bad for Bill Clinton's midterm prospects. In fact, that induced red wave in part. And so the first lady typically wants to kind of be in the shadows, kind of like Laura Bush and Melania Trump. But yeah. <clears throat> They're not going to have any influence once they leave the White House. And that's totally true. The lack of influences will impact the Biden's wealth. The family has no way of making money outside of trading on Joe's power. When that power completely disappears, the opportunities will dry up, which is also true. Think about that. You know, while Vice President Hunter was able to get on the Burisma board, getting paid six figures, millions even, not being qualified on handling, I guess, petroleum in Eastern Europe, I think. And so just think about that. Do you think they're going to hire joe biden's nephew or whatever when he's not president why the why why would they do that you know when your uncle's a senator when your uncle's the vice president and the president of course you're going to get jobs but in the case of the biden family they're going to start starving relatively quickly if they don't save their money now so additionally they have a legitimate worry that the authorities will investigate and charge them with crimes if biden were to leave office republicans promise to utilize the justice department against them if they went back to the white house the bidens think that only joe can beat trump if you can truly believe and worry a president trump will go after your family then it's log logical to want joe to stay in needless to say legal troubles will hurt the family's finances and what little power they have outside of politics which is obviously true Democrats don't really have leverage to push Biden out of the race. Conservative pundits speculate that they could use the DOJ even to bribe the Bidens out of White House. But these extraordinary measures aren't going to really happen. A Democratic-run DOJ is not going to go scorched earth against their own president running against their worst enemy. The Bidens know this, and they're not worried about that. They're also not, there's also nothing the Democrats could bribe Biden with. Nothing can make up for the White House and the power of the presidency. The Bidens are also too obstinate a-holes. So these overtures would only piss them off, which is true. I agree with what Scott's saying here. Scott's asserting, obviously, that the Bidens cannot be tempted with a golden parachute. What golden parachute is there? Um, because think about it. Joe Biden is, is somebody who is only relevant because of being president. You take him out of it and he's useless. So even if the Democrats were to say like, oh, Joe, we're going to put you on the board of this Fortune 500 con uh company and we're going to give you millions of dollars through like implicit bribes and all these other sugar deals for your drug addict children the truth is is that uh that doesn't make up for being president for one and two uh joe biden's kind of like the sh uh, he's like the captain who isn't really worried about a mutiny despite uh treating the crew members like garbage because nobody else knows how to steer the ship and so he's just betting on the fact that they won't want to do some sort of like uh self-inflicted uh, injury because think about it the joe biden's thinking okay well i already beat trump which is a facetious argument for a couple of different reasons but two he's also saying well look i'm your only guy i can only leave i'm only not the nominee if i say so and i don't want to leave and so you're stuck with me and insofar as you attack me you embolden trump and we all hate trump more than you guys hate me and so that's the basic proposition also scott brings up a good point with the doj biden has been saying, oh my God, you know, they might prosecute everybody that's Democrat if Trump were to take office. And so he's saying like, okay, not only am I the only one that can stop it, but even if I drop out and another Democrat wins, that's not really ideal for Joe and his family for two reasons. The first one is that, do you really think that, let's say Kamala were to become president and let's say even beat Trump somehow, do you think she would go out of her way like Gerald Ford and pardon the former president and his uh, children? No, why? because she would take a popularity hit. And why the fuck would they do anything to help Joe Biden? Okay, why would you, again, Joe Biden at that point would be, let's say 83 years old, Hunter is a drug addict, whatever, felon. Okay, why would you pardon those people when they're out of power? They have no leverage at that point. So as soon as Biden says like, okay, I trust you guys. Okay, you know, gentlemen's agreement, you'll pardon everybody I care about and take care of us financially if I do drop out. What's it to say? What leverage would he have then to let Kamala like, you know, it's it's the sort of Damocles is what I'm saying. OK, let's look into this a little more. The more realistic scenarios can also be ignored by Biden. Right now, the strategy among dissident Democrats is getting prominent lawmakers and donors to politely ask the president to step aside. But there's zero chance in hell that is even working. Not a single Biden wants to leave the White House. Both Jill and Hunter want Joe to stay the course. 
Biden cares far more about what his family thinks than what Chuck Schumer or Barack Obama thinks. Biden also has a trump card. He can simply ask his petitioners what they will do if they do not step aside. All of them will say they will support him because they don't want Trump as the president. He will then laugh in their faces and tell them that he's staying in. Okay, so notice this. So, like I said, 17 politicians as of right now have said, hey, Joe, step out. But that doesn't really change anything. In fact, it just makes it awkward. It's like if you're at somebody's wedding and you say, you know, you know, in the movies, they're like, "Okay, well, uh, you know, anybody who has anything to say, you better say it now or keep your peace. And so what you're going to be like, oh, actually, no, the marriage is bad. No, you you just made it awkward because not only are you not going to stop the process, but now people know that you're a pariah, that you're the one that's out of order. And so for a politician to stick their neck out against Joe is stupid. Of course, there are going to be some people in purple districts, namely Jared Golden in Maine, who will say, "Okay, well, you know what? Just for the sake of staying elected, Joe's unpopular in my district. I lose nothing in dissing him and saying he should step aside. Um, And that's why a lot of people will going forward do that. I think Henry Cuellar is another one. So, again, these like red state Democrats will probably say Biden step aside, but that won't really make a difference because Biden has the leverage, obviously. Obama would be the one person where you'd say, okay, if Obama literally tells you like, hey, you're unfit to run, that might change things, but that's a huge stretch. I think he's too much of a coward to ever pull that trigger. Obama is. Anyhow, Biden's entire campaign pitch is that he is the only other option besides Trump. This works for both skeptical and powerful Democratic voters. They can only get another candidate if Biden were to step aside, and he won't do that. They are stuck with Biden since their polite request carries no stick. The New York Times editorial board admitted it would still endorse Biden if he stayed in the race and the very op-ed that was calling for him to drop out in the first place. So Biden is right to be unmoved by this. The Trump card also dissuades Democrats from pursuing more aggressive measures. Let's say donors threaten to withhold their money unless Biden were to step aside. The president would just tell them this will get Trump elected. Donors might not stop giving money for a little bit, but they will come back once they remember that Biden's the only option. So again, Biden's money has been drying up as of recently because of this whole crisis. But obviously the donors only have one option and it's to give it to Biden if he's refusing to step down. So this definitely does help Trump. Obviously, if you know Biden goes a few weeks without funding, that's crucial. And you know it, it'd be lofty to say like, oh, well, they're gonna just gonna give the money that they would have given in July in August to Biden when he's the nominee. But it's like, no, I think that's a stretch. But anyway, <clears throat> Democrats could try to eject Biden at the convention, but it's also a risky move. It would... Turn the convention into a disaster or, and also help Trump regardless of whatever outcome it is. There is no agreed upon challenger to Biden yet, so he could personally personally prevail due to a divided opposition. The opposition would need thousands of delegates to go along with this, which is a tall order under any circumstances. There's also an issue of campaign money. Every cent donated to the Biden-Harris campaign is legally bound to Joe himself. It would be a complicated process to hand over the cash even if he were to drop out. Some experts say, though, that only Kamala Harris could access that cash, but if Biden is to be involuntarily replaced, you can bet he's going to keep that money just to spite the Democrats. Remember, the Bidens are assholes. They would rather the Democrats lose than the magnanimous in defeat. So think about that. Biden has the ultimate kill shot here. And some people might say, oh, well, we can 25th Amendment Joe and then Kamala inherits the money. But it doesn't really work that way. It seems by all uh, means that Biden has control over this money no matter what. And most of the money, as far as I know, hundreds of millions is with the Biden-Harris campaign. And like I said, it's not like Harris can just take the money from Joe. Joe would have to give it away even if he were to step down. So that's likely not to happen either. The disastrous possibilities of a contested convention solidified Biden's argument for staying in. There are two recent examples of the party freaking out and wanting to replace the nominee. In the spring of 2020, there were serious calls to oust Biden over the terror raid scandals. Hilariously, they favored the person to replace Biden. Uh, He was rumored to be Andrew Cuomo, who also later resigned due to Me Too allegations. The story fizzled out and Biden went on to become the 46th president. The calls to drop out were not near the level of what they are now, of course, but it does illustrate how Biden can just ignore the noise of the news cycle and just count on the Democrats to return to his camp. I agree with this. A a more comparable situation is the one that Trump faced following the release of the Access Hollywood tapes the month before 2016. Lawmakers and Republican donors, as well as conservative pundits, demanded Trump drop out after it was discovered. He said the grab him by the pussy comment. Trump ignored the demands, positioned himself as the only alternative to Hillary Clinton, regained the support of the majority of the critics, and won the election. Biden will do the same, except for the part about winning the election. The question is of whether or not Biden will drop out will be solved very soon. Democrats are set 
to host a virtual nomination of Biden later this month to meet the Ohio ballot deadline. If Biden gets the nomination, then the question would, would be finally settled. The only chance the Democrats have of getting a different nominee is if Biden were to have a, a severe health episode and literally cannot function anymore. Outside of that, Biden will be on the ballot in November. There is no way Democrats can persuade him or his family to abandon their dream. And that party will grudgingly accept this once the news cycle moves on. So let me give you a little bit of a snapshot into what's going on today, July 12th. As you guys can see, Joe Biden is disapproved by 19.5% net people polled. Uh, so most recently, that means that 37.3% of people approve of Joe Biden's job performance as president of the United States. 56.8% disapprove of his job. So again, like I said, that's a negative 19.5 spread. Let's move this to when the debate, uh, right before the debate, as you guys can see, it was a negative, hold on, let me be thorough, a negative 15. After the debate, it went to negative 19. He's slightly worse than he was before even. Uh, so that is the snapshot. So we're brace, we're basically locked in with a President Biden who is super unpopular and is poised to lose in a dramatic fashion. This Scott Greer article I read in passing and I thought, God, I should make a video about this because he really puts into words what I was thinking the whole time. But it kind of just illustrates in great diction what's going on exactly. So check the description down below if you want to read a Substack article. I really, really like the writing. Uh, and like the video if you liked it at all. I'll probably forward it to him so he sees what my commentary is on it. I read it almost verbatim just because the way of the way that he writes doesn't really line up with the way I talk in my head. And so I kind of had to change some words there. But I hope y'all were not too disturbed. And if you don't want to be disturbed, do not look up Frank Biden, younger brother Biden, Newt. Do not look that up, please, for the love of God. It's not a good site. But I'll see y'all on the next one. Uh, adios.